Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 321, my fun chat with podcaster and improviser Fiona Howitt. But first, I thought I'd mention how Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Audible is that app that you've definitely heard about before. You use it to listen to books. You know, my mom used to get CDs from the library and listen to books in the car on her commute to work. This is just like that. Audible is a user-friendly app that connects you with books you want to read and gives them to you in amazingly well-produced audio pieces. When you sign up, you immediately get access to hundreds of books and podcasts automatically available as soon as you start your membership. Then, every month, you get a credit, which you can use to buy something outside the included catalog, like that thriller they just turned into a Netflix movie, or that self-help book you've been wanting to check out. There are tons of books to choose from. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to sign up and get your account today. It's a fun and easy way to entertain yourself during your commute to and from work. And now, let me tell you about this week's guest. This week on Yes But Why, I chat with British podcaster Fiona Howitt about all of her favorite things, improv, storytelling, and role-playing games. This was a great chat, and we had so much fun. Check out Fiona's two RPG-related podcasts, What Am I Rolling? and The DM's Book Club. I now present to you Yes But Why, episode 321, Fiona Howitt, on finding what makes you happy and doing it. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why. Yes But Why. Yes, but why? 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 This is the Yes, but why podcast. (laughs) So, Mm. the thing that I like to start with to talk to people about is um, how you played as a child. What were the games that you were playing? Did you have siblings or cousins or friends around that you played with, or did you play by yourself? Hmm. So I think the thing I can think of mostly is that I do have a younger sister, but we're we are four years apart. So instantly, any sort of games that we were playing each other would playfully hurt the other one. <laughs> there was you know certain bits, and we played lots of imaginary games, you know, dress up, all that sort of thing. Um, but I think for me, I the most sort of enjoyment, most sort of play stuff I got out of was a mixture of reading lots of books and then acting out the scenes in those books, usually by myself and usually having an audience of teddies, obviously naturally voc- vocalizing all the best bits. Uh, I used to, I used to reenact, oh, it's so long ago, I used to reenact soundtracks, so like the Oliver soundtrack. I remember being very vividly that like I would act out all the parts of that, again, to no one in particular, and usually by myself, you know, I'd be fading at one point and an artful dodger at another point. Um, and then I went down the big rabbit hole at, at like one Christmas, my, my grandmother, uh, who's sadly passed now, but she got me a PlayStation one. And then I never looked back. I was always video games. I you know, playing those. Like I remember playing Tomb Raider and if, if anyone's ever played Tomb Raider, it's a great game. You know, you've got an amazing lead. It's all about fit history and you're, you're shooting bad guys, but there's also mythical stuff. And I could get past the first level because I had no concept of like, like clues and, and like a, like escape rooms and, and puzzles and logic so i would just wander around looking at the buildings <laughs> in the really terrible uh pixel art essentially uh and then eventually i, I worked i worked out how to use the internet and i'm like oh look there's like F- a game faqs and i i would then cheat essentially but play through the games but it was always just amazing to be like build on this love of like exploring playing games finishing them and uh, certainly going into stuff like uh japanese rpg so you're thinking of like final fantasy uh legend of dracoon is the one i always remember because there were four discs and i just remember playing out these stories and getting really involved in characters and they're certainly the legend of dragoon one is the one i always remember because it was definitely like a knockoff of some sort of japanese anime or something like that but one of the characters at the end of the first disc minor spoilers you know 30 year old game uh, dies and i cried I, I obviously I trained him up. I did all the grinding stuff. I was like, oh yeah, his dragoon is the best. And then he 
he sacrificed himself and his his the the gem spirit or whatever went on to another character who took on all their stats and i was just sat there going I, that's not what i chose <laughs> i i want him back and then later on you get him back in a side quest but it's a, you know, always sort of thing and i just it just made me fall in love with the idea of stories and being a part of being a storyteller because ultimately that's that's for me is the biggest thing is that if you tell a good story if you're a part of a good story whether it's just you telling it to an audience and there's no interaction or if you're part of like role-playing games which is now my big sort of obsession and creating a very unique thing where you know you're the adventurers and you you, you beat the the bad person but also at the same time you're inept and you're just dealing with your own flaws and stuff like that but you can do stuff and think outside the box and make these incredible characters which you will never see again and have and having that connection with somebody else it's it just is incredible. And I, and I I always come back to that idea of like wanting to perform as a kid and wanting to try out these things and realizing that I can have impact on these stories in some way, whether it's through like playing through buttons or reading them and then creating the scenes in my head and, and acting them out loud, essentially. So it, all of that, all the games of the place have really told me that if I want to be a good storyteller, you need to have all this, inf like not information, but inspiration from places and gain it. And then it doesn't matter whether you're retelling the same story uh, as long as you know you treat it with respect and sensitivity and stuff, but you can also create your own stories, and somebody out there might listen, which is just like mind blowing to me even now. Yeah, I love the idea that you developed the storytelling ideas from the video games because mm. I'm not quite a video game kind of person. Oh. I was just slightly too old, I think, for getting into that. There was a I'm more of a uh, basic car driver kind of game situation very simple mm -hmm. but i appreciate what you're saying initially about tomb raider where it took you a second to like get into the puzzles and like yeah. understand that it wasn't just about looking around because i always think that too whenever mm. i whenever somebody like makes me play they're like check this out i'm always just like oh look at this seems cool I, can we check it out they're like no we've got to move forward i'm like oh okay, yeah sure sure <laughs> like okay. oh there's an effort <laughs> okay um but like i like that i like that you spent all this time exploring it and like mm. getting into the world and like looking around and also that you know i always think about the um I used to be dumbfounded by the idea that people would watch other people play video games on yes. YouTube. I was watching my nephew watch this person play a video game, and I just mm. was like, hey, buddy, I need to know, why are we watching this? What is it about this <laughs> that you are interested in? And he blew my mind when he was like, well, this person has a lot of points and a lot of money so they're able to unlock rooms and spaces in this game mm. that I can't because I don't have a lot of points mm. and a lot of money so I get mm. to see parts of the game that I don't usually get to see through mm. watching them and also he'll teach me ways to get there yeah. without requiring this that or the other and so then I he's essentially showing me how to use the game better and I was like that's so fascinating. And this kid yeah. literally is like eight years old, by the way, telling me this. Like, mm -hmm. I, my jaw hit the ground. I was like, finally, I understand what you guys are doing. I just thought it was weird and like this voyeuristic situation of watching another person do something, which, you know, mm -hmm. I get. But at the same time, like the unwrapping videos where you're like, why? I don't get that gift. Why is it fun to watch them unwrap mm -hmm. it? But like, I appreciate that from the voyeuristic yeah. point of view. So mm -hmm. I thought that's what this was, but like to find out and then now to bring it back into your mm. using it that way that like you can use every resource around to mm. get better at this game, to like learn how it works because like mm -hmm. it doesn't, not all of them, some of them give you tutorials as you go through where it's like mm -hmm. press this and you can do that. But yeah. you know, that's not usually the kind of thing you're looking to do if you're going through this mm -hmm. exploration adventure game, mm -hmm. you don't want it to tell you what to do. You want to figure yeah. it out. So exactly. it's just really fascinating. And that, that, that was the way that you got into storytelling. Also, I feel like video games get a bad name clearly they for do. me um, <laughs> as well, but like, as far as like creating a, a bad scenario, like that they're hurting the people that are playing them. Yeah. Whereas it sounds to me like it really just scratched the creative itch that you had and helped mm. you understand storytelling in this like wide world building, like mm. scenario, like 
Yeah. I uh, recently too was in a writing class with a um a younger student who was like he told us that he ha- was really into building the worlds of video games and that like he wanted oh. to take the writing class to develop the ability to write out these whole worlds and then he and his friends were going to turn them into video games but he really wanted Mm. to develop the whole thing first and Mm. he didn't quite know how to do it so that's why he took this writing class to like and I was like dude yes like amazing and and it opened Mm. my mind to like just more ways that creatives can use their skills and like Mm -hmm. can put it out there it's not like your creative bit isn't good because it doesn't fit into this box or that Mm. box you can find a brand new thing like creating a video game and 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 then there's multiple choices there's like so many you don't have to make you know some people are like i can't write a novel because then i'm gonna make a lot of decisions turns out in these games you can give them give the character the option to make 45 decisions like yeah and that's amazing that's so Mm. wild now as far as your creation has gone as a storyteller are Mm. um is this what led you i know that you're um you do a lot of rpg and and dungeons and dragons was it Mm -hmm. this kind of storytelling that led you into that world or did you write in a different way and get into it in a different manner how did that Mm. develop for you well, in, in that is a really interesting question because I think I got to a certain stage and then I went to university. Like we were talking before about that 18 year cycle thing. And I think as soon as I got to university, I was like, oh, I'm not cool. <laughs> and hid everything. Oh. And like, but possibly. we all, It's interesting when I interview people on my podcast, they're asking them like what RPGs did they get into? And they always had that bit as a kid, like getting into it. Like for me, unfortunately, I didn't know anything about RPGs or role, role playing games or anything like that until much later on. Yeah. And I didn't do anything. I didn't. I didn't even do sports stuff. I didn't. I just. I just because I was like, I'm. For me, the most important thing in that time was like, okay, I need to have friends and pass my exams. And there was just yeah. that focus on like, need to get to the end. And then once I've got my degree, I'll get a job and I'll get to the end and and I'll, I'll be okay. And exactly. like, I, 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 I had such a good time. I, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed my university stuff. I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. But when I finished it and then finally moved to London, where I am now, almost 10 years later, I was like, oh, what do I do? Because suddenly all the people I've made friends with, this is again before the big sort of explosion of sort of Facebook had just sort of come out of social media stuff, but it wasn't the same instant connection that we have now. So I was yeah. like, what am I going to do? Uh, so, you know, newly newly single in in London, I like, didn't know what to do. So I was like, well, what are my interests? And it was usually lots of notice of, I would like, I joined the Doctor Who Society as, uh, at a university, uh, you know, so it's, it's great. Uh, and and I have all these sort of these interests and I was like, well, I now need to go and re- and that's my, one of my biggest fears has always been having to restart from scratch back to square one. So obviously being in a new, and this happens to everyone I know, but going to, you know, even a new town, new state, a new country, you have to start from scratch and not have that support network. So I go to London, and I'm like, well, I'm going to search into, into Facebook and we'll see what there's there. And there was um, a, a Quidditch team. It's now called Quadrable or Quadball even because they've had a big name change. Yeah. Um, and I, I sort of, they said, oh, we're going to have a practice. Someone, someone wants to come to my house and pick up the equipment. And I was like, oh, I'll come. And I traveled like half an hour and I got to this person's house and I knocked on the door and I was like, I actually don't know this person. I don't know anything about them. And I've just turned up at their house. I, I could die <laughs> as a general sort of safety thing. But then I never looked <laughs> back. I, I never, But I never looked back. And, and that's what I've done every time I've gone to a new hobby or trying something new. I'm like, if I don't do it. I won't know if it's been like if it's if it's something good. If I do it and I hate it, I'll be like, you never guess what I did. I pl- I played Quidditch, but it's now called Quad Ball, you know, all that sort of thing. But it went from I played I played Quidditch uh, Quad Ball now for about five years, and I played in different teams. I helped set up another team, and it was a way to make friends. And I realized because obviously this is when I graduated, graduated uni, a lot of those people who were playing this sport were different ages and stuff. So we we had the same interest, but it was still struggling with like, okay, we're now moving, we're leaving the university a bit, but now we're in a big city. Well, we're going to do, we're going to still be with our friends because we're going to play this sport. And then from there, I started playing other sports. I started playing sort of, uh, there was like those community teams of like uh, adult dodgeball and, and basketball, but just to try it out. And let me tell you, Emmy, I'm not a sporty person. Never have been really. I tried. 
I, I was terrible. I, I cannot dribble a ball to save my life, but I'm tall and I can, I can stop people getting things in, in the hoops and stuff. And then like <laughs> tag rugby and, 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 and the touch uh, rugby, all that sort of thing. I could have a go. And again, I've stopped doing it now more recently again, COVID stuff happened and also there's, as all with all communities, all sporting stuff, people take it too seriously. So, but I was like, yeah. I've done it, I had a go, I've got some medals, I've done all right, great. But then from that, from that, from actually having a go at stuff, somebody then said to me, hey, do you want to try Dungeons and Dragons? And I just remember back from like this, these fantasy stuff, um, seeing people talking about it, you know, seeing it in films, I thought, why don't I have a go? Like, it's something that I probably will like, but if I, I'd never done it, so I was really scared. I was really nervous about trying it out. And then as soon as I tried it out, we had a session and I was like, I love this. I want to run this. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I, I appreciate what this person did. I'm going to start running it. So I started buying the books <laughs> and I started, and this is when Kickstarter was a big thing as well. So all these zines, all these PDFs of new RPGs coming out. So I was just buying them and, and or supporting them. And then I just had a huge to read list to read books pile um <laughs> and i was like oh no i'm never gonna get through this and i was like well what am i gonna do because you know and i was like wait i want to make friends or i want to meet up with my friends and let's do that support thing i want to run these games i also want to get better at my job and do some audio stuff and just trying stuff out why don't i do podcasting and start making these little one-off sessions little stories and, and get people to connect and try new things and that has been basically my life for the last four or five years is running these games and just getting as many people like you know and it doesn't have to you don't have to be smart with your clever like that's a big improv thing i know but even if they're like oh there's lots of rules i'm like don't worry i've made a cheat sheet because i don't know all the rules either and it's great it's just getting people involved to just have a go um so yes yeah, so it weirdly sport helped me just like give it a go and then i'm like i'll just give it a go and i will help other people give it a go as a result yeah I love the idea that you got to Dungeons and Dragons and were like, yeah, I'd like to run this now. Like, <laughs> yes. yeah, this is my thing. You're like, thank you. Oh. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. I'm going to be in charge. Uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm done. You, you can leave now. It's the dice, those books. Fine now, yes. <laughs> All of it? Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. Get out, get out. Hi. Yes. Yeah, sure. uh, no, I love it because it's such a, you know, you found this thing that you wanted to have ownership over, and, and I appreciate it. And I also appreciate how ownership over these kinds of games is so loose. Like, yes. it's not even like you truly have ownership. It's just like, oh, I just want to know everything about this. I want to seep yes. myself into this world. And mm -hmm. and also, like, I'm pretty sure the way that you developed your podcast to learn all these games and play all these games is, like, also how book clubs are born. People are yes. like, ah, oh, I want to read this book, but I'm not going to do it on my own. What if I could get mm -hmm. a couple of my friends and we all sort of like exactly. bug each other about getting it done? Like in the same way that you're like, I want to learn how to play this game, but the only way that I'm going to mm. do it is if I like make myself beholden to these guests that I'm going to have and exactly. like have them, oh, I've got to get it done for John. Like if I don't get this all organized, what's going to happen mm. when he comes over and we're, you know, there's gonna be mm -hmm. nothing prepared you know i feel like mm -hmm. that's so mm -hmm. much like and to the same point where podcasting becomes like a social thing legit mm -hmm. this is how i meet people yeah. this is my yeah, like yeah, yeah. social hour i mean like like real talk audience uh fiona and i talked for an hour and 50 minutes before we hit <laughs> go on this thing like that's how we're like making friends you know and and that's what i mm -hmm. love actually about this because mm -hmm the I get to connect with people and we're mm -hmm. all over and we get to connect on this one thing that we're both interested in and exactly. then like and then like move on in our lives and I like the idea that that's your setup mm -hmm. as well now did you have clearly based on the job that you told me that you have earlier like you have technical prowess uh, in some way so mm -hmm. you had already, how'd you know about podcasting? How did you like get into that? That seems like a, we've talked about sports and storytelling, but like now you're like, by the way, I also know I how also. to do audio recording and all this. And it's like, 
<laughs> Whoa, okay. I thought that was going to come mm. in somewhere where it was like, we were doing uh, a lot of games at my house and then the pandemic hit and we were like, we can't mm. hang out, so now it's going to be Zoom. Mm. But no, like you were already like, I'm going to turn this into a podcast. How did, yeah. where did you get that knowledge and like, how did you decide to put those together? Yeah, so again, it's it was an interesting thing because for my work most of what i do is i create content but for the academics so basically it'll be stuff like uh, a voice of a powerpoint it would be like a welcome video and stuff and uh, not to name and shame or anything like that but academics at times are really bad at doing welcome videos yeah um bec because it's very hard right so like right. Right, right now i'm staring into the camera i'm just talking away being very relaxed because i i can do that but i if i was a script i'd have to learn it and then say it to it i don't have we don't have a teleprompter uh because that a it's a bit expensive but also b doesn't really help if they don't know what they're saying and also they'll just write down what they want to say and all these important to get all these points in it'll be usually three pages long and also it'll be very lots of technical jargon and all that sort of thing and it'll be terrible because obviously they'll be there squinting because they don't have the glasses on and they're not looking into the camera and it's <laughs> it's a nightmare and so and also then once we'd filmed it they'd be like i'd be like can we watch it back and see you how you felt about it i can't watch it back i don't like looking at myself and so i was like maybe an easier thing to do would be to just do audio and i was trying to put it across to my work that audio is so good because like podcasts were on the rise you know i listened to several as i was going to work uh you know like i think for me the biggest one going back to that storytelling thing was like welcome to night vale this idea of this random community radio in the middle of nowhere which is you know twins peaks inspired very weird but enjoyable and and also had music in it and was beautifully soundscapes and stuff so i was like yeah. i we should do more about this at work and i'd love to know more about it and of course work were like no oh, yeah sure sure whatever and then i saw there was a, a podcast workshop and i was like well i'm gonna go go train myself you know i thought i'll go do it and i sat down in this workshop with other people uh and the, the guy there i remember his name mark he, he'd done various uh, various podcasts and of course i can't remember any of them to mind because i didn't listen to them in the end but he was just like all you need is an idea and it doesn't matter if everyone has done that idea because you're the thing that makes it different and i was like that's so true because again i did a quick look and they like well i'm into role-playing games let's see what what is out there and let me tell you i mean there are so many dungeon dragons games out there so many so many actual plays and they're all run by the same four stereotype men in a basement terrible audio they always do a session zero where they're like ah oh, this character's hilarious because he does puns and it's all about various body parts and you're like god i'm not listening to how many episodes have they done 70 i'm not listening to that uh, <laughs> and it's you know because everyone's getting going so i sat and i thought well i don't have to just do dungeons and dragons that's the big thing and it, and it still is the most popular world's greatest role-playing game but actually there are so many other role-playing games out there so many different ways to tell stories that don't rely on having lots of dice it could just be tokens it could just be conversations it could be just cards and i was like there must be a way to showcase different systems of telling stories just through audio only so i decided to sit down pick up a couple of games and go write the script for them how would i do a how to play this game and then have an example of the session but it can only be audio only. So I had for the first couple of sessions, I'd be like, you have to overly describe everything you're doing. And and we were doing this in person as well. So I had like one of those uh, H4N uh, Zoom things, popped it in the middle of the table. And I was like, and of course you, you like, I remember this, again, one of the early episodes, so, someone's dad comes in and starts making lunch for us. And it's just very lovely, but it's really awful for audio. <laughs> so we had to stop. Somebody was <laughs> You know, everyone's always eating and they're like crunch, 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 and then all dice rolling, all that sort of thing. And then it got to it got to a uh, pandemic, or just before the pandemic, and I got invited on to do a, a Call of Cthulhu game that somebody else was hosting. And they said, Oh, we're gonna record it via Zoom. And I was like, Oh, I can do this online in my own time, but also then connect with players in different time zones. And that blew my mind. It's such a simple thing now. But then as a result, I just I started moving lots more recordings online. And thank God, because as soon as as soon as everything started to shut down, I was like, well, I still have, I can still plan games. And it can be something that people can look forward to, because we're all currently trapped in our houses. But at the same time, it meant I could then start sharing things. So like I could share maps if I wanted to, I could share music if I wanted to, uh, mm. easily and make that immersive environment, you know, making sure people were comfortable with it. And totally. you know, having 
having stuff like accessibility stuff now it wasn't very good back then but like subtitles and 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 making sure like oh, okay we're about an hour in let's take a quick bio break people can go off and stuff instead of people what would normally happen people would get up in the game and go or something we could like oh we're just going to take a quick break so we're away from our screens and as a result that meant the recording online stuff meant i just learned so much more not only just about playing games and how to do it online even more so and actually actually be able to capture the audio very easily turns out rather than doing various cards and stuff but actually in a contained thing but also just making it a better experience for people so that they want to play online and they can do it at their own convenience and it's not oh i've got to trek at you know 45 minutes an hour drive to so-and-so's place i've got to bring dip i've got to bring <laughs> snacks you know and then oh we're gonna leave you know at half 10 because we're gonna be back because we've got an early start tomorrow whereas everyone's already home it's it's a different thing is it i know it doesn't work for everyone yeah but it just made me realize that i can podcast from anywhere i can play games from anywhere. i can do even improv from anywhere that's great and i, I just it just made me feel like okay i can make this my thing that like, have that ownership thing again and I'm, I'm just gonna try it out and if it doesn't work I can just leave the Zoom room and go, well, that didn't work. No one's ever going to see that recording. Oh, well. <laughs> and then go and then be in my own house. I don't have to percolate on it when I'm on my way home. So, yeah, that, that's that's the podcasting thing and the thing. And I just, like you said, it's such a cool way to connect with people because often than not, people do listen, even if it's just the first five minutes. And it's and it's scary. Like I had, um, I, and I do a lot of solo RPGs as well. So that's when you it's just one player, usually yourself. And you just you create stuff, and a lot of it's usually journaling and usually very reflective because it's just the nature of these solitary games. And I did one called uh, Long Haul 1984, which is about you being a truck driver in the US. Uh, something bad has happened, and there's no one else alive. No one knows. No other people in the US. It's just you and the road and the truck. And so I did it. And what I always do, I always put it out on social media, and I tag the creator. The creator listened to all of it. And then put a little TikTok video and say, like, this is really cool. Here's a snip from it. And she's done all these other things. And I was like, oh, my God, he's listened to all these things. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, it was like imposter syndrome. But of course, these these game designers, they they don't hear about people playing their games. So as soon as you tag them in it, of course, they're going to listen to it. So it was just a way to make friends with game designers who create really fun stories. And they get to go, oh, you did this story about my game? That's so cool. So yeah. anything like that is just amazing. They really, I bet you they really appreciated that. They were, like, so psyched to find out that, like, somebody was playing it and enjoying it. I mean, what's exactly. the point of any of these things that we're making if not for someone to enjoy? So exactly. when someone lets you know that they've taken in what you've put out there and, like, it mattered to them, oh, that's mm. so great. I love it for that person. Yeah. Like, I, I love it for you that you got that feedback but like mm. just the like just I don't know I'm imagining in my head like this person who like just like is googling themselves like we all do we all and do then that, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's like what there's <gasps> this thing like mm. oh you know finally someone appreciates my creative output right and mm. there's it's so heartwarming uh, for mm. that person and then they supported you back which was so great exactly it's Man. yeah I, I was i was stunned but but even then i'll get emails i, I got one recently of somebody saying i listened to two episodes because i wanted to i was about to run my own version of this game and i really enjoyed it because it was it was a it was one it was a one shot with my sister it was just the two of us and i was just like we'll just try this game out and this person was like i hadn't considered playing that game like this and as a result of what you did and i was like, i've created my own game i thought you'd want to see it and i was like oh my god so i was like well i'll i'll signal boost and all that sort of thing thank you so much for sharing that with me because this person could have gone those episodes they were good all right i'm just going to create my own thing and not tell me not give me that like feedback back and i had i've had people email me and say oh i was looking for a certain system that i wanted to play but there's not any actual plays out of it and this is the thing a lot of the role-playing games i play i will google beforehand to see if there's like a how to play or if there's an actual play because that's usually quite helpful so because i just to confirm that i've got it right yeah. and this person was like i was looking for a game that wasn't necessarily the big dungeons and dragons because my daughter she's still quite young and i wanted to make sure that she had that creativity because she lots she loves creating stuff and so this another system yours was the only one that, that came up top of the search and i listened to it and it's really inspired me to play this game with my daughter and i was like yes more women in games and i was like ah well let me know i can help <laughs> here's my cheat sheets so i was just like i i want certainly and that's the thing i think for me coming to it so late it was definitely the re one of the reasons i didn't get into role-playing games really early on i think because it was always like oh well the, the men are playing tabletop games the the boys at break they've got their warhammer whatever oh it's it's not for girls or whatever which i know and again at the time i was like okay oh i like drama 
oh, but I, w- but I wouldn't get it because, oh, it's got dice and math. And then, and then suddenly I'm like, oh, I can do these things because I am a grown up and I can choose what I like and don't like. Yeah. And I can create these stories. And so I was just, I, I, and attitude shift and all that sort of thing. But I was, it was that big realizing moment where I was like, I don't, I could do it. If no one, if no one else is going to do it, I could do it. And it doesn't matter what gender I am or anything like that, as long as I want to do it. And that's it. Stuff everyone else who says I can't do it. Yeah. I love that empowerment. I love that you have it for yourself. I love Mm -hmm. that you're giving it to other people. And you're right. I mean, yeah, we've certainly been alive during a big cultural shift, I think. And Mm -hmm. yeah, when we were younger, there was a lot more, you know, you can't do this if you're, you know, a girl or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's a lot more open. And I think being of the, uh, of, of the vague generation that we are at. I, again, I mm-hmm. don't know how old you are, but like we're like in that vague time where like when we, we saw the change happen. So now when we yes. meet these younger girls, we're like, embrace this, know that yes. you can do this because yep. if, I don't know if anyone's telling you not to or not, cause we're kind of in a different world, but you can do yep. whatever you want. Like mm-hmm. and you can create all this on your own. Mm -hmm. super Mm -hmm. cool i also love this idea that like your whole um i not only was you trying to get into learning these different games but like you're just exploring all the different kinds of role-playing games that people are trying to create out there and Mm -hmm. trying to play them and see how it goes now you mm. seem to be quite a positive person. I don't know if that's what you think of yourself. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I wonder, if you ever um, had a game that you found and you tried to play it and it turned out to kind of not work? Like, this person put it together and it, it just didn't work. And then if it didn't work and that did happen, did you mm. put it on the internet or did you go like, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and say that we tried that to ourselves and not put it on the mm. internet because it doesn't really work. Um, has that ever happened? Oh, that is, that's very interesting. There's only been one time that I've, I've gone, I've, I've, I, I, there's only one time that I've abandoned an edit completely. And that was more purely because the people uh, involved, it was just three of us. And one person hadn't sent me their audio file and it, neither of them were wearing headphones. And it was just, it was just a slog. So that was the only time I abandoned it. It was more for technical reasons, mm. but I've definitely had games where I've gone, something's not clicking and stuff. And it's, it's very interesting. I again, I don't know about yourself, Amy, if you've, if you've ever played any role-playing games or, or ran role-playing games, but obviously there is this big sort of, responsibility when you're the game master the facilitator the keeper whatever you want to be called um that at the end of the day you've created the world people play in it but you are the final adjudicator and you want to make sure things go you know things things are working in favor of players and everything is fair in, in quotation marks and a lot of the times like there's a lot of pressure to make sure you have the rules right certainly with dungeons and dragons i know i keep coming back to it but it is that's one most people will have have heard of people will have experienced of it and one thing that when i first started out there was a big worry when i was talking to other uh, female presenting uh dungeon uh, dungeon masters were like well i'm always worried that they're going to know what the monsters are as soon as i describe them because obviously everyone's read the books and the great part about playing other role-playing games that no one else has played is that you can make up the rules and it was and it was so much like a power thing but there was definitely but at the same time a lot of my games because of the improv thing i do try and just roll off that and if it if it's good if the team's going in a certain direction i'm like okay we're going to move there but as a result as a as a, a game master sometimes i feel uh, and this is definitely not imposter syndrome per se, but I'm very aware that I talk a lot and I'll be like describing things and all that sort of thing. And then I'll be like, okay, what do you players do? And I'll sit there and it'll be 20 minutes, of, 20 seconds of silence. And I'll be like, oh no, <laughs> I've, I've ruined it in some way because I've overspoken or something. I did a game recently which uh, had six people I, uh, online, which is very difficult, I think, because half of them didn't have their cameras on and all that sort of thing. And they don't have to have cameras on, but it, it's a very different experience, right? Because in person, you can catch certain cues, nonverbal cues. Online, you're working a little bit harder for the GMs and the players. And I'm listening back to the edit just now because I'm just editing it. And whilst the game itself... I do very well. The players, they're not. Yeah, I know. I know. I have to do that now. I'm like, yeah, I did, actually did a good job beforehand. I would be like, no, oh, it was all my fault. And that's some back going. Actually, I did a brilliant job. And actually, 
the play, it's it's more of a reach for the players because I think they're just like maybe overwhelmed, maybe they're not necessarily as engaged as they could be. But as a result, what I do in the edit, I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to shorten that combat down to five minutes, and it's just cut, 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 and move it up. Whereas in the edit, I'll in the actual game itself, I'll be like, yeah, I'll narrow it down to two two choices and stuff like that. And eventually, I'm like, this person's not getting the game. And that's okay. As, and at the end, I'll be like, I hope everyone had a good time. Let me know if there's any constructive feedback, etc. And they'll be like, oh, no, I really enjoyed it. Because, as we all know, people who... it's Maybe it's an improv thing as well, is that we obviously react to people laughing or we laugh, you know, react to people's faces and stuff. Whereas most people keep it on the inside and keep quiet. And they're like, I need you to be really vocal. I need you to make big choices, because otherwise... I won't know if you're there. I don't know if you've dropped off the call or anything like that. And so th those bits I found difficult. Whereas it rarely is the game itself. I think because ultimately you can change the game to be whatever you want. And I always have a disclaimer at the beginning saying, hey, I might get some of the rules wrong because I'm human. Deal with it. Like, yeah. I, you know, because ultimately it doesn't matter as long as I always think as long as the players have fun and then also as long as I have fun as well. Yeah. Um, and But it, it can be quite hard. And I definitely have some sessions where I'm like, that was a lot of work. But I've, I've read, I like I said, I've only once thrown out an edit, and that was all only only because of technical difficulties. Yeah, now that's really fascinating. I think it's really smart to use your improv experience to help you develop stuff. Like, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, if if the path of the existing story that that you're given in the rules doesn't quite continue or like like you said mm -hmm. the other people like come in with an idea and you're like okay this is where we're gonna go great i'll follow mm -hmm. along with you i'm sure that mm -hmm. helps you really greatly but yeah it, it can be tough when people mm -hmm. don't seem to be ready to get involved I, exactly i um I was like, how far are we into this episode? Are people going to be listening? Uh, I've had a couple, I've had a couple yeah. of interviews where the person just either wasn't in the mode to, yeah. um, I only have, I've only had one ever where we were about 10 minutes into kind of the pre-chat and the person yeah. just went like, I'm sorry, I've had the worst day and I'm really trying right now, but I cannot do this today mm -hmm. can we reschedule and i was like yeah yeah sure sure sounds Perfect. fine i'd you, much you rather reschedule <laughs> yeah i'd yeah. much rather reschedule and get you when you're in the mode exactly. to chat about stuff mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. sometimes when i'm talking to people and i feel like i really have to pull it from them oh, right it's so hard yeah mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that that brings me to the idea of when i was telling you earlier how i taught like level one improv classes like mm -hmm. people express themselves and like you were saying a second ago about the guests that you have on your show like people express themselves in lots of different ways and like mm -hmm. yes big big face theatrical people who are like let me tell you what i'm feeling there's that crowd <laughs> but then there's this the kind of people who and it's almost in my mind i always think it's like film acting it's a lot yes. of like tiny movements and a lot of whispering like mm, whenever you watch mm -hmm. movies and you're like why, why are they whispering what's happening yeah. why are they whispering big, to each big other big mumblers you're yeah like, i need subtitles come on you're oh like I, what are you people doing but it's like that's just the way some people express themselves like yes. small little bits versus these big huge moves and mm -hmm. the hard part is like especially when you're recording it or when you're putting it online or uh. you're putting it together you're like i need the big moves could you give me a few big moves yeah a few big moves just to make sure that you're there that you're enjoying it and i yeah i agree it's i think like the edit I'm thinking about, like it just took them a little while to get to it, and at the end they were like, "Oh, I really enjoyed it." And I'm like, "Oh, I didn't feel like it though." And I just, I, yeah, like you said, it did, I think there's a mixture of like if you don't have your cameras on, or if you, if you don't feel comfortable, then maybe you do shut inside yourself. It's just so much easier in person, like you said, so you can see those little subtle things, and you're like, "Ah, so that's what you're doing." And and that felt familiarity as well, because I didn't I didn't know any of the players before we started the the recording either. Aww. It was through a, a recommendation, so I was like, "Oh," and then at the end I was like. Well, I hope they had a good afternoon. <laughs> oh, well. And then left the Zoom room and then went to make yourself a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope it worked out. See you later, bye. Well, bye. <laughs> That's how I feel about teaching corporate improv workshops. I'll, like, right. teach it. And, like, two people will be like, that was really fun. And everyone else looks kind of confused and weird. And they're like, um, thanks. And then I leave. And I'm like, okay. 
Well, well, two people told me, so I'm all right. Yeah, exactly. You take that energy from them. <laughs> yeah, or I mean, really, it's like I just want to soak into – sometimes I just want to soak into the brains of people who don't think the way I think a little mm-hmm. bit of what I've got going on. Like we were talking mm-hmm. about improv earlier and how it has mm-hmm. a vaguely religious vibe to it because mm-hmm. it's essentially like a an, an art form that says, you look at the world this way. I'm going to show you a different way to look at the world. Mm-hmm. And I think that whenever I teach – people who are not necessarily planning on being performers, but they want to sort of see into whatever this little bit of art is. I try to give them a little piece of that to kind of Mm -hmm. understand you might not live in this world, but here in this world, this is what happens, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then they're like, Oh, that's what you people are like? And you're like, oh, yes, we yes. are. <laughs> Don't be afraid of us. We're just trying to have a good time. Yes. Um, that kind of stuff. But like, mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy that. Now, speaking of improv, let, I would love mm. to know in your journey, like how did you find improv? You're involved mm. in this great um, podcast and you're like leading these groups and you're doing all this work to develop these worlds for everybody so you're clearly primed and and like you said even as a child to be a storyteller but Mm -hmm. how did improv find its way in because to be honest uh just so we're clear a quick google of you is all improv it's uh yeah all sorts of talk (laughs) of your improv experience and work and so uh so clearly improv has been a big part of your life as well Tell yeah. me, how did you get into it, and how does it connect to the storytelling vibe that you enjoyed from the role-playing games? Mm. So when I first started the, the first podcast, which is what am I rolling, these are the RPG one, I also uh, was like, once I ran a one-shot of a system, I'd cont- obviously tag the game designer who would listen to it, and I'd be like, we could do an interview. And I then panicked, because I was like, oh, God. you know, And then I talked to him about it. And then one of the questions I'd always ask is like, what would be their main advice or big tip for someone who was about to run their system, which, you know, is, is quite good in a sense of like, it's a nice broad thing. They can talk about themselves a little bit if they want to, but also, you know, it's like, oh, that's a really interesting way. I hadn't thought about that. And one person uh, who I, now I forget, as usual, as of all these stories, I forget which game designer it was. They said, oh, take an improv class because it means you're open up to more things and it's okay if you get the rules wrong. And their game was very rules light, I seem to remember as well. So I was like, that's a great idea. And I, I, it sort of hit me after the interview. I was like, I th- I'm in London. There must be an improv. And I searched and obviously like, <laughs> there, there is. must be. Uh, there must yeah. be. And, and, then there's, and then there's one starting in two weeks. That's an eight week course. Okay. Oh, I've booked on it. And then I then continued, like, I, I just put, plunged myself in at the deep end. And, and, and as, a, like, as someone who does have social anxiety, I was there beforehand, like 20 minutes beforehand, because I'm super early. And I'm like, this is the worst decision I've ever made. And then other people, and then obviously 10 minutes later, loads of other people, loads of other socially awkward people going, is this where the improv is? And you're like, oh, good, yes. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then after that, I just was doing it like every every time a course finished, there'd be the next the next level, you know, all different levels and stuff. And I got to the final level, level four, hoopla, whatever. You know, so we didn't. So we've gone from short form scenes, long form, and we were about to do like our, our fight. We're like one week away from the show, and we and I was, I, you know, it was great. I was enjoying myself. Everything was great. And then it was March twenty twenty, <laughs> and everything shut down. <gasps> uh, and I and of course there's that moment where you're like, am I not an improviser? <laughs> Which is such a stupid first world problem. And then the next week, uh, Steve Rowe from Hoopla was like, I'm gonna try online improv drop-ins. If anyone wants to join me, come. And I was like, sorry, I'll I'll try it. And then as a result, I just started using improv as a way to, okay, today's Tuesday, it's improv day. And then just started doing more and more classes online, started meeting people and doing seeing the same faces. Cause obviously, again, I know it's to do online improv, you know, needing certain things like, you know, certain fast internet or or, or, or any of these things to, to at least access it. And I was just super grateful for it because that meant I could experience this, something I loved in a different format. And, you know, meeting people and keeping that connection with people. And I know that online improv isn't the same for, it isn't something for everyone. I know some people who just was like, I don't want to do it at all. And then I've gone back to it just recently. But for me, it's it sort of cemented what I learned and it meant I could try so many brand new things and then coming back into like this now sort of hybrid thing, I can I've been to my first festival this year. I went to the Edinburgh Improv Festival, and that and I performed with people I'd never performed with before. I went to see all their shows. I did classes in person for the 
for the first time since the pandemic and i was just like i just realized that how much i enjoy that and giving myself like this is what i spend my sort of bit of income on on anything else it, it's not clothes not food really it's improv uh, just being able to teach myself and then being able to do stuff and i don't actually perform that much i did a lot of online stuff and unfortunately i know it's sort of tailing off a little bit because people are going back to it but it's just one of those things where i'm like i can always just go and perform and i you know i've had teams and stuff and we perform regularly and now uh, again unfortunately covid people are back to work and back into more fixed structures and stuff but i'm always like i just want to try it out and and go and go to a jam or go go try with a team people if people will have me and want me and then just have fun and learn new styles and learn new structures and formats and just give it a go because honestly it, it is such a way to connect with people who like you like you were saying are on the same level as you in a sense of like you like improv great come in come into this little little tiny rehearsal room okay we're all frogs excellent you know i can i can get into that <laughs> but all but also, it's so interesting to see, actually see it from other people like, oh, this person, certainly in London, we have a lot of people in the financial district that come and do improv. But we also have teachers. We also have people who are just uh, office workers. We have people from outside London who commute in to do these courses. And I was just like, actually, I'm meeting a lot more people than I would normally. Cons I, you know, I consider them all friends now from like just doing online stuff. But it's just like, I know this person before it would be like again going back to that whole like 18 years thing you seem to be like okay your uni friends your school friends your work friends and then maybe some other people if you've got hobbies and then hobbies sort of like can be so flexible and sort of changeable and stuff that you might lose people whereas i'm always like well in the improv i can connect with people you know who want to who, who like the same things and we can keep that connection going we can again social media has been great in that sense because you can just send people an email you can send people a, a, a whatsapp or anything like that and i just for me it's a big part of my support network it's something that i can do uh, no matter what but also it gets me that chance to get that little performer out of me who never did it and, and regrets not doing it in that first 18 year cycle but actually i feel so much better now because I, I don't have i would say uh, i mean i still have it in the sense i don't have that sort of like anxiety go, oh but what if i'm not good enough i'm like I, I've just arrived, and the fact I'm here is amazing, uh, and you should all be glad. <laughs> Brilliant, excellent. I will get the first round at the bar, you know, like hooray, you know, and and I just want to bring that energy to it. That it's not about like, oh, I hope I'm good enough. I'm like I am here. That is good enough for you guys. <laughs> I want you to take this exact thing that you're thinking of right now and use that when you first move to Iowa. Oh, like, brilliant. That vibe of that. like, well, I'm here. You guys are going to love mm -hmm. it. I'll buy the first round. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because then they're that. like hey she's fun hey, oh hey, she's great she's yeah. great yeah <laughs> at the end of the box. day <laughs> the number one thing that has gotten me through most scenarios is i mm. walk in and tell everyone how happy they are to see me like <laughs> like i just come yes. in and i'm like you guys i'm here who's psyched i know i am you guys should be too <laughs> and then like they're just amused so even if they're like who is this girl they're I just know. like she's told me to be happy she was there like what yeah. but yeah. i don't know there's a certain it's, thing it's it's weird because i i cause i had i thought i thought oh god now i can't remember but i talked to someone the other day and he says it's very interesting because you have this this sort of persona, this like, you're glad that I'm here and I, I was good in that thing, but <laughs> you're not like that at all. And I'm like, I'm not. Like, I, I'm, I big up this egotistical version of myself because, frankly, like, it's because I'm just like, cause it, I, to me, it's so ridiculous that this person who has very bad social anxiety at times, who, you know, who, who just, you know, will do what she can. But then it's like, if I say this, everyone, certainly because we're all British polite people in my current community, they're like, <laughs> what and i'm like i thought so <laughs> and then and it's just funny because it's just it's so ridiculous that i would say something like that which doesn't hurt people hopefully and it's sensitive and i'm just i'm just very aware of that i'm just like because otherwise we're all sat in silence and and then we're waiting for people to go like slap their knees and go right well i should have gone half an hour ago and i'm just like oh you know it just 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 to have that communication and just to be bombastic characters because otherwise we're just these boring people in offices who who <laughs> have to deal with academics who can't read scripts and can't look into the camera uh and then don't and then don't want to listen back to it in case they look bad on it yeah they never do look bad they look fine they just look they look scared because they can't remember the words that's the only thing <laughs>
There are famous, very attractive movie stars that won't watch themselves in movies, though. So there are people mm-hmm. who you think of as like, oh, my God, I could stare at that face every day of my life. And they're like, I've never seen a movie with me in it. What do I want to look at this? And you're like, we all do. You know, yeah. and, but <laughs> <laughs> to bring it back to your like the egotistical character, sometimes I think and also I feel like it totally feeds into uh, you're like, that's new who I am, but P.S. It totally is because I yeah. love the part in your story where you're like, there was a game and that needed a leader. That's me. me. I will yeah, be the yeah. person who is in charge of this. And yeah. the thing about being a leader is a lot of times you have to um, take people by surprise because like mm-hmm. people want to be led, especially in a scenario where like you really are like the leader of this you know, DM, you're, you're DMing this, uh, this, uh, event or like your, um, the leader in a class or something mm. like you want to put people at ease by being like, nobody could be weirder than me. So let me show you mm. what the options are. There's this wackiness <laughs> and there's you guys. What do you think? And they're like, well, maybe I'll get there, but I'm not there yet. Um, and, and it also like, Certainly for me, I'm a I'm a lady in my forties. I mm-hmm. lean into wacky aunt vibe mm-hmm. everywhere yes. I go because mm-hmm. it's just easier. And then people like give me what I want and don't ask questions. Yes. Um, like if I'm just <laughs> if I'm just like super direct but also kind of kooky, they're uh, they're like, oh look, she's wild. I was like, you can just call me Aunt Amy. All right, give me that thing. Okay, <laughs> see you later, everybody. Um, the other thing is. <laughs> number one it's a great leadership setup right people yeah. love hanging out with you yet they do what you'd say and yeah. they like think it's the right move you're know, like why mm-hmm. wouldn't i do what she told me to she just wanted to have yeah. a good time right yeah but then exactly. there's also brightening people's days do you know how many mm-hmm. people are just sort of miserable in their little moments of life like you yeah. go in so whenever i go to Anywhere, really, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Like my, you know, the person checking me out at Target or like I go to the, into the gas station to pay for gas or, you know, Mm -hmm. any little interaction that I have, I always try to be wacky and kooky so that that person (laughs) either has a fun story or just a fun moment for their day where Mm -hmm. like they weren't thinking about whatever sad thing that's going on in their own life that they're like focused on like Janine doesn't love me anymore. And I'm all like, hey guys, what's going on? Are you wearing a clown wig? Oh, that's just your hair. I love it. Okay, see you later. Uh, and then they're like, what was that? <laughs> like, I, I prefer to live my life as a Kristen Wig character um, pretty much everywhere because it really mm-hmm. works out for me. And, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and people just, uh, I feel like it's the right move. And also, you're mm. right. Like, I... I put myself out there in this big, loud, proud way. But, like, when I get home, I'm always like, oh, God. Everybody Mm. was like, who is that weird lady? And then the the voice quietly in the background goes, that was your point. You're the weird lady. It's all right. Yeah, And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That was my effort. I wanted to be a weird lady. Yeah, that's my cue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's the right plan. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, what's more fun than being, like, weird Aunt Amy? Like, yes, I'm here for you. Like, yeah. (laughs) I feel I feel like I am like weird Aunt Fiona, but to my friends who currently don't have children, but I, I am already at weird Aunt Fiona. And like, oh, there's Fiona again. What? Oh, she's doing, she's inviting us to improv. Well, best of luck, Fiona. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's fine. You don't you don't have to come, but I'm gonna keep posting about it until eventually one of you comes. I don't who's it gonna be? Who's gonna who's gonna I volunteer as tribute? You know? And then they go, I had a good time. I was like, exactly. Are you going to come again? No. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, the hoi polloi, they don't know how to live their lives. Like I said before, man, they, uh, they just have little drab gray existences and and Mm we're the wild fun rainbows that dance in front of them. And you know, that's, uh, I'll take it. It seems fine. (laughs) I'd rather live my life of, uh, of wild, vibrant, silly color than, uh, than just be like, I guess this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Super sad Eeyore. Uh, oh. Nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it, Mm-mm. right? Mm-mm. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fun. Uh, you mentioned you took your improv classes at uh, Hoopla. Is that the name of the mm-hmm. theater? Awesome. Yeah. Hoopla, yeah, yeah, so fun. I'm. Uh, are you still connected with that uh, community in the post-pandemic world? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing a couple of courses in person and online with them just now. Nice. And I am trying to. I am trying to be like, can't just go to one school. I've got to. Yeah, we were talking about this before. Like, I am going to try and do other schools and stuff, but it just has to line up with my schedule. Like, sure, I, I, yeah. the world. The world does revolve around me. Um, but it's just. It's <laughs> I mean, just well, trying to. Yours does. <laughs> yeah, mine does. <laughs> but I, I am trying to be more aware and like try and take more stuff from that because I know, it's, like, like we're saying, that you don't want to just, it, just a way just to learn new things. And I think I will say, and I, you know, I'm sure loads of your listeners and loads of people you've interviewed have been like, our oh, hoopla is great. I will say that it's one of the most rewarding communities in the sense of like it was so welcoming. I again, I know it's it's very like easy to say, oh, you don't have to be funny, clever, or or, or any of these things. Just be obvious. But it, that comes from the top down in that structure. I think all the teachers I've had there have been super warm, super kind, just super lovely to be a part of. And just and they've you know and I followed them into other things. I've been to see them at their shows, and I it's and it's like now it's kind of weird again. It's I'm like oh I'm friends with some of them, and then I'll meet them at a barbecue, and I'm like but you taught me this class, and again that's me breaking down that whole. Uh, not stigma, but that whole sort of cultural thing in my head saying, well, we're not, we can't be friends because you taught me this thing. But I'm like, oh, improv, it's so fluid. It's so funny that you could be friends with people, you could perform with them. And the, your your old teacher turns around to you and goes, I really enjoyed that scene. And you go, oh, oh, they noticed me in that scene. That was great. And yeah, I just, I, from that point, I think this hoopla, if anyone is starting improv or wants to take a class with it, I 100% would recommend i don't know if they are doing online stuff anymore but i really hope they do do it again because it was such a it, it was such a lifesaver for me in the in that early pandemic when i was like i don't know what my my whole world shattered in 48 hours because all the because i was very i didn't realize how much of a extrovert i was going out and doing things because i was you know i was into theater i'd go see the theater by myself I'd go to see cinema by myself because even when you're trying to organize diaries as adults it's bloody difficult so i was like oh, i don't have time i'm gonna just do it myself because otherwise i'd just be sat at home probably being sad so i was i yeah I, i'm very grateful to see Vro, who is uh, one of the founders of hoopla who was like i'm gonna try this thing and i was like i am here to support you steve Vro, and i will be here i will be at every online drop-in on a tuesday and to say hello and it was it was very lovely to meet him in person and he was like fiona online improv and i was like yes <laughs> you yeah, remembered i love it yeah i had a i took i've been taking this uh writing class or being part of this writers group for two years and the person who runs it the uh leader is here in the same town as me and it was two years of us online and then we finally met in person and it was so crazy oh. to be like oh my god you exist and the oh. idea of how close we lived <laughs> like oh, i couldn't adorable. believe how crazy because we we'd be online and a few people were in austin but a few people were other places and we'd just be like with the awesome people be like wait where are you oh, oh i'm in the east oh really I'm, I'm in central oh my god and then like oh. later when i went over to her house she taught a workshop in person and i was like i'm gonna meet her i'm gonna take it and i like went over there and was like ah it was so amazing to finally so connect cool. yeah to these like great people who did this work for us that like prepare, mm -hmm. like made this space for us at a time when we needed a space. 100%. And like, that was, I mean, it, so wonderful uh, of every person. And like you said earlier, like I appreciate that there are people that didn't want to do online improv. No. I get it. Like sometimes it's the physical visceral in the room vibe right. that you want. And I get it. I like yeah, that too. I that. Um, that's why I like talking to large groups of people. Like I always go uh, over 200 people. If I can talk to them all at once. Yes. <laughs> yes. The more people over 200, I'm into it because I like the idea of staring at this mass of people and imagining they're one person that I'm talking to. Oh, and, wow. and, and so like that gives me energy. I love doing that because mm -hmm. people are always like, I'll always volunteer to host at weird corporate events. Like I've gone to podcast festivals and I'm like, oh, mm. can I MC this thing? And they're like, yeah, nobody wants to MC. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let me do it. Because uh, I just want to talk to, that's what gives me the excitement in person, right? Mm -hmm. But I love mm -hmm. the online improv because I just, in my mind, it was different. And it was like mm. a different vibe. We were able to open doors across the world yeah. to one another. And that mm -hmm. in and of itself was like, this is amazing. I'm so happy that we get to be friends. I mean, like even even the workshops that we're in um, mm -hmm. together where it's like the people are all over the world in this workshop and we meet every few weeks. Like, I love mm -hmm. it. I love it. 
the fact that I get to check in with everybody about like, and what we talk about the nature around us is super mm. fun because mm-hmm. it's such a like, let's connect to the world and connect to the world that other people are experiencing. And mm-hmm. so these online connections are different, but they, for me, allow me to see the world in a, like the global view that I now have, that I understand of the way things happen is Mm -hmm. insane like I did not see the world the same Mm -hmm. way as I do now and Mm -hmm. and you know the performance of improv or anything online whether you like to uh, watch it or be part of it even if you're not into it it is a valid interesting art it is a wonderful new collaborative means Mm -hmm. I mean think of all of the improv duos that never met or like Mm -hmm. like they just do Mm -hmm. it on zoom or like people who created whole shows that are like across the world from one another right like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um like one of my favorites there was a show and I can't remember the name of the show but Joe Bill and Balastri Viswanathan were doing this wonderful like improv show with the two of them and they were like across the world from each other and they would Mm -hmm. like chat about um therapy topics and then do improv and it was like Mm -hmm. i love that this is happening i love that they were like let's bond over this particular specific thing like Mm -hmm. and just get into it and it was like this is so fun like that Mm -hmm. we get to do that i mean like again even just us being friends like um and now i'm all like "Ooh, you're gonna be in my time zone it's gonna be great (laughs) i was like you can call me at regular times and we'll be at the same time it'll be great um whatever i can do to help i am there for you um but like this this world it, it has been so amazing and i'm so glad that we are you are able to connect with the mm. online improv um mm-hmm. and 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 we get to make these friends you know there's yes. there's ups and downs to what has happened and i'm just happy that we get to now be thankful to these creative artists that were strong enough to yeah. make these rooms for us to be in you know mm-hmm. thanks to steve thanks to my writing teacher natalie like doing that work for us helped mm-hmm. us get to a place where now we can get back into our own spaces that we create for other people. Um, exactly. So interesting. Um, mm-hmm. All right. So I have one final question for you. I want to ask you, what are you doing for yourself to fill up your own creative cup? Like, what are you doing? And it doesn't have to be like, this is what I'm performing right now, or this mm-hmm. is what I'm, what my new creative project is. Mm. But as we all have sort of figured out, there's the output of creativity and then there's the receiving in of other stuff. Like, are you going Mm. to see plays right now? Are you Mm. listening to music? Are are you playing a particular video game? What's the thing that's um, reinvigorating your own creative spirit? Oh, that's such a good question. Because I feel like, as always, it's not one thing. So I just, I'm like, pick up shiny thing and go, one thing I am (laughs) loving and it is a podcast <laughs> it's it's cool and it i don't know how i even really found out about it like it must have been like an instagram reel or something like that but there's two australians called tony and ryan and they're just uh, two australians like both into audio stuff uh one was a radio host and one was an audio engineer and they just they met during just before the pandemic and then obviously the pandemic stuff happened they were like we're quite funny let's let's do a podcast together and okay the content the content isn't, isn't necessarily highbrow um but what i love about it is that they have a lot of fun together and that's that's always been the thing to me is listening in like i like i always listen to podcasts when i go to sleep as well and, and the best ones are ones that they're all chatting away and they're having a laugh and stuff and i'm just like, like everyone's happy and i'm now gonna sleep through it but i've been bl- going through their back catalog and it's just you know the stories and they started podcasting like last september or something like that and they put out like three short episodes a week and all that sort of thing and wow. just the the, and also i would say they're not traditionally what you would expect maybe of like streamers or podcasters both of them are, are plus size uh both of them have you know big hair and all that sort of thing and they're just but they don't care and they're very much very good at like if there's a topic that comes up that they're both like the you know like for example they're like oh they talk about exercise you're like you know what whatever you want don't care whatever you know and and it's but they do it in such a way that's very loving and not judgmental and stuff but they'll also do stuff like uh like they'll do stuff which is like things you can say at this location but also in the bedroom and they'll just make each other laugh and it, it's so rude sometimes i have to i have to definitely listen to it with my headphones on but then i just laugh and it just 
I, I think like the you know like it is what it is. I will say big content warning. Says it's not definitely not safe for work, uh, but it will make you laugh because they're just they're just it's just nice to hear people just talk. And there's no agenda. There's no nothing like oh we're going to sell you all these things. It's just they, like the bite sized stuff. So a lot of the times it can repeat itself. But actually, it just feels nice to just to have two people who clearly love each other very well as and really love their jobs and love like being silly together. And so, like, like I said, they did to do the sort of the naughty innu- innuendo ones. They'll tell a story which obviously leads up to something, and then obviously it's revealed and they're like, nah, nah, mate, that's not normal. And you're like, yeah, I don't think that's normal either. <laughs> <laughs> And then they always end their podcast on uh, "You'd love to see it," and usually it's that something that makes like it's a wholesome thing, perhaps. And like, I saw this meme, I saw this, meme. or it could be something that made them laugh. And it, again, like it's like a twenty-minute episode, and you can blast through them. And I just, I just, I think it's just something that makes me joy that if they can make a podcast on their personality, like being fun, the very funny people, uh, do, just living their lives as as this job, and then obviously now going on to greater things because I think they've been picked up by Spotify, like. Nice. I can do that, you know. I I I can I can do these things and stuff. And I've done stuff for like um, like a, a rooster teeth. I've done a couple of stuff for them, but in in passing this in Austin, uh, and they keep t- t- saying, "When well, are you coming to the US?" And I'm like, ASAP. If you if you need me, please let me know. <laughs> like rather than You're amazing love things. I yeah. So like I always I'm always appreciative of listening to those things, which are not necessarily traditional like actual play podcasts or, or anything role playing stuff. But if I listen to something and I, I can hear that the hosts are having a good time and the same with improv as well. If I can see them having a good time and I know there's that whole sort of thing like, oh if you're making someone corpse laughing or something like that, then oh you, you if you if you're having too much of a fun time, I love it when I see people enjoy so enjoying the space between people because it makes me want to be in the room with them and ex- and share that experience even if it's indirectly as an audience member. So yeah, that's that's what's been overfilling my cup. I guess. Yeah. What's the name of the podcast? <laughs> it's simply called Tony and Ryan. Uh, Tony and Ryan podcast. That's oh. what it's called. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's Basic, so really. funny. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, very, very simple. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoy that. Now, I think that there's something wonderful about enjoying somebody else having a good time, you know, and mm-hmm. and it definitely opens yourself up. Like when you were saying in the podcast class that you took, that they said like you are what you bring to it is what makes it special clearly Mm -hmm. what tony and ryan are bringing to this conversation is what makes it special i'm sure there's other podcasts where people are like just making Mm. jokes but it connects with you in this like Mm. something about their personalities connects with you and you're super into it like i have a few podcasts i listen to a lot. There was a couple that I listened to for a long time, and then I felt like me and the hosts' vibes diverged in a way mm-hmm. that I was like, I don't love him as much anymore. Like, he's different. Mm-hmm. This, these, and like, I appreciate it's like he's gone through this in his life, and now his point of view is XYZ, and I just yeah. don't get that anymore. So mm-hmm. I don't listen to it happen anymore. That's not sure. to say that, like, I don't tell other people, yeah, listen to that podcast is yeah. great. Really, if Absolutely. you're into this kind of thing, you know, but at the same time, you know, every there's something for everybody and the beauty mm-hmm. of there being millions of podcasts is that you can just find these tiny niche groups that are making mm-hmm. something and you're like i love these people like yeah. everything that they're doing is great and the work that they put in is so fun mm-hmm. and like they make me happy there's nothing wrong mm-hmm. with being happy no I oh, agree. Totally. Oh, whatever makes you happy do it right Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Fiona, mm-hmm. thank you so much for being on the podcast with me and chatting with me about all sorts of parts of your journey and just storytelling in general. It's been a great day chatting with you. Yeah, I know you're happy to be here with me, so it's all fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm also happy to be here with you, so that's all fine. We're yeah. both way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does help that we like met each other in a different context and enjoyed each yes. other's company, and then we're like, oh, wait, we should bring this to the uh, podcast world yeah, that we get going. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so fun, so fun. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, and yeah. uh, I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all of our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.